until my parents got married, so that, or I should say when they got engaged. But anyway, so I, I grew up in Butte, born and raised here, lived here until after college, then moved away for 48 years, and came back about 12 years ago, and I live out <clears throat> near Three Bears, and that's I've been a member of Rotary, however, since 1992. And my wife and I got kind of backdoored into Rotary in that we were asked to become parents of an exchange student from India by one of my wife's friends. We took her on, her name was Priya, and Priya lived with us for a few months, and one of my friends who saw me at Rotary all the time said, when are you going to join Rotary, McBride? <laughs> so the rest is history. And we joined Rotary, both my wife and I did, and we really have loved it. It changed our lives, and it really has made a difference. In 2005, we attended the Rotary International Convention, which was in Chicago, and that was the 100th anniversary of Rotary International. At that convention, there was a big display of the first 100 presidents. And lo and behold, as I'm walking around, I come up on, wow, Thomas Jefferson Davis from Butte, Montana. I had never heard of him. Uh, I later on heard a lot about his children and his son-in-law. But at that point in time, I didn't know Thomas Jefferson Davis from Adam. <clears throat> I used to come to Butte on a regular basis, every summer just about, and I spent a lot of time in the archives here researching my family. And so one of the, so that summer, I came here and I started talking to Nicole Ivankovic, and I said, do you have anything on Thomas Jefferson Davis? And she said, how many, book, how many books, I mean, how many boxes do you want to look at? <laughs> so, that's the way it all started. That was my beginning of researching about Thomas Jefferson Davis. <clears throat> Later on, when we celebrated our 100th anniversary, our club did in, 2000, in what, 2015, uh, I decided to do a little story about Thomas Jefferson Davis, and that led into more research. And finally, a couple of years ago, I said, you know, I think I'm going to write a book about Thomas Jefferson Davis. And so it took me about three years, two and a half years, to write this book. So here's the book. I've got a few copies up here. I am selling them for $20, and $10 goes to Rotary here in Butte, and $10 goes to the archives. So the archives really helped me get garner all that information. The other thing the archives did, which I found fascinating is that they collected and saved huge amounts of information that I don't know where it would have gone otherwise, probably in the trash can, because nobody was, I don't know who actually gave it to them, uh, but at some point in time, they collected it. So who was Davis? He was born in Kansas in 1888, came here as a young boy, and his dad was a mining engineer, and he started out like a lot of little kids, and my, my uncle and my dad did the same thing, they sold newspapers. At that time, you had four newspapers, two evening, two after, two evening papers and two morning papers, and so the kids not, delivered papers, but they also sold them on the streets. It was a, a rather difficult job. They had to have strong fists and tough minds because they had the, the best places to, to sell it was down there in Park and Maine and a few of the bars. They'd go in the bars and sell the newspapers and newspapers at that time sold, I think, for a nickel, but they might have been less than that at some point. Anyway, that's the way he grew up. And later on, he went to the Butte Business College for his education. He must have gone to a grade school, but I don't have exactly what, where he did that. I don't have that, that particular piece of information. But he ended up going to Butte Business College, and the Butte Business College was a pretty popular place. Both two of my uncles went there. There were over 600 students 
at the Butte Business College. They took accounting, bookkeeping, all kinds of things like that. I don't know what else they had, but they did have that. And it was a popular place. It was actually more popular than going to the high schools. So that's where he went. Somewhere along the line, he decided to go to law school. And I have no clue how he got how that exactly happened. But he went to the University of Michigan Law School and went, went there for three years and graduated in 1912. Very interesting story. He was also a prominent athlete, particularly a baseball player. He played baseball here in Butte. And when he was at the University of Michigan Law School, he played baseball for the University of Michigan team. He was uh, so good that the Pittsburgh Pirates actually offered him a job at the end of his college career. And he said, no, I got to go back to Butte. <laughs> so that's what he did. And he came back to Butte and became an attorney here in Butte. <clears throat> When he was made president of Rotary International in 1941, one of the first things he said, which I always found fascinating, and kind of typifies the kind of person he was, but he, his comment on <clears throat> one of his first speeches was, there is no greater problem confronting mankind than learning how to live together. Remember in war where it just started, Nineteen, we weren't in it yet, but war had begun. But as we are spending astronomical sums each day in learning how to die together, cannot we spend a little time in, in searching for a means of living together? I think that could be said today. So it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting thing. But he was a very, very strong proponent of kids, of getting kids involved, of helping kids out, of teaching them, and so on. And one of the first things that he did was to help establish the YMCA. At that time, in the early, between 1915, 1916 era, he and his compatriots were able to raise approximately $700,000 to build a YMCA, which is, the building is still located, but the Y is not there anymore, over there in Washington Park, in Park Street, right? So, <clears throat> they raised 700000 which in today's numbers would be a little over, close to $8 million. And they built this edifice. They gave scholars between his group and a number of other groups in town, not just the Rotary Club, but his group and, and the Rotary Club and the other clubs in Butte, gave out scholarships essentially to every kid, every boy, I should say, not every girl, fortunately, but every boy in Butte under the age of 16. And it cost them roughly $60,000 a year, which is a pretty phenomenal number. In addition, one of the big things they did, and there's a story written in my book by a guy by the name of Scott. How many people played football or watched football back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in Butte? Do you know? And Scott was a timekeeper. <clears throat> and if you ever remember, he was always out there with his revolver and his pistol. <clears throat> He was an old guy. I don't know how old he was at that point. But he, that's the one, he was always at the end of the field. He had his revolver out. He always shot off the revolver at the end of the game, halftime, quarters, whatever it was. But Scott wrote a, wrote a great story about the 1920s and what the Rotary Club, Tom Davis leading that, and a lot of other clubs in town did. Knights of Columbus were also involved, Elks Club was involved, and there were a few others. But what they did is they started football teams. There was a big problem in Butte at that time, a lot of kids running around without any jurisdiction, without just going crazy, stealing, robbing, getting in fights, and there were a lot of gangs. Each little 
area, we even had a gang. We even had a gang when I was growing up. It wasn't quite that vicious, but we had gangs. Anyway, those gangs were out of control. The Butte police were trying to do something, and finally Davis and a few of his friends said, you know, what we ought to do is form teams. And so what they did is they got guys to start football teams. And <clears throat> they appointed kind of the leader of the gang as the captain of the football team. Great idea. So by the end of the year, they had a sizable number of teams playing. I think they had eight or ten teams playing. And they gave prizes out at the end of the year to the winners and who did the best. But it changed the atmosphere. Changed the atmosphere in Butte about boys and gangs, and the police were amazed at the whole situation. A couple of years later, they started baseball. They did the same thing with that, and basketball, and eventually they even did hockey. It was a little difficult to finance all this stuff, but they were really they had great help from lots and lots of people who volunteered their time, effort energy and monies to these different projects. Scott, in his story about this, really goes into depth about each one, telling about each, how many people were involved in it. And the games, the final game, was usually played at the final game of the Butte Central Butte High football game, which was usually the last game of the year or sometime in November. Later on, they they played in front of as many as five to 10,000 people watching the game, which is pretty incredible. So here's a bunch of Ray Tay kids who were involved in all the, the things that kids get involved in and involved in that, some pro profitable, productive things. So that was what is first in, in the YMCA, the whole thing about kids and getting involved and trying to help kids out. It's a very interesting thing. There, uh, he was also involved in Rotary, obviously. And Rotary at that time in Butte, Montana, was a big deal. We were the first, Butte Montana Rotary Club was the first Rotary Club in the state of Montana. It started 10 years after the International started in Chicago in 2005. He was the president of the local club a couple of times. He was also the district governor, which at that time the district included not only Montana, but parts of Idaho as well. So he was very involved. And then he got involved in Rotary International, and he became a, an officer in various things, and he, and he did a lot of work at Rotary International. And finally was elected president of Rotary in 19... Our Rotary year starts in July 1st, 41 of the year, and ends in June. So he started 40, 1941, 1942. I cannot imagine when I was doing all my research on this, I, I came across a number of things that were pretty phenomenal. So 1941, half of Rotary was at war with the other half of Rotary, when you think about it, okay? So we had Germany, Italy, those countries all at war with the UK, France, and the US hadn't entered the war at that point, with each other. So Rotary was a really divided situation, as well as the world was a divided situation. So he came into it, into it at a time when I can't even imagine what it could have been like. In my book, I, I literally do have some of the speeches that he gave, both before he was elected president and after. And I'm not going to read all those speeches, but they're kind of fun to read in the sense that it really tells the story of what was going on at the time. The, the one thing that I came across up here was reel-to-reel -reel tape. I since have put it in on a 
CD, but it was an interview given to him while he was in England just after he was elected president. So it was sometime in August or September of 1941, and he was over there, and the Germans were bombing in London at the same time that he was giving this, he was meeting, I should say, he was at a, at a meeting of a Rotary Club in London. And he talks about what that whole experience was like, and the radio station that gave, was an international radio station, and it was broadcast here in, in the U.S. on a Sunday evening. So they had direct contact with him. And he described what was going on over there and how the people were standing up to the Germans and, and how he had been out to see a particular family where he saw the whole thing bombed out. Everybody killed in the family except the husband who was searching through the rough, rough, <coughs> the rough areas and looking for anything about his wife and daughter. So it's a pretty phenomenal thing that he was there. That was his last trip to Europe. After that, he could not go to Europe after, you know, again. So he was kind of, and we declared war then finally in December. So he was forbidden to go over to Europe. So he spent most of his time in South America, various other places. Haiti, believe it or not, at that time, had 44 Rotary Clubs, and so he spent a lot of time in, you know, I'm sorry, not Haiti, but uh, Haiti did have some clubs, but uh, Cuba is the one that had 44 Rotary Clubs, and he spent a lot of time there. Over the years, I have met one of his daughters, her name was Shirley, and Shirley, I got, finally got acquainted, and she was living in Scottsdale, Arizona. She just died this past summer. I didn't get to see her just before she died. I did talk to her on the phone. But I, but I spent about five, about five years ago, I spent some time with her. And she described Tom, and she, when she was in high school, she was in high school in 41, 42, and she went with Tom to a lot of his meetings in various places, particularly in South America. And she described him in a little, very interesting way. Tom gave lots of speeches, they're pretty long, and she said he never even had one note with him, which is kind of an interesting thing. One of the things that Tom did as an attorney, and what he was known for, is that he not only represented corporations like Safeway and a few others, but he also, his number one customer was the mine union here in Butte, which was pretty fascinating that he would on both, be on both sides of the fence. Not too many people were in that deal. They either they represented one or the other. He told a few stories on a regular basis, and this kind of describes a little bit about what Tom was like. He used to talk about the one tree in Butte. <laughs> and particularly, he tells a story about this particular guy from Cornwall who lived up in Centerville decided he was going to put a garden in his backyard. And he took out the rocks as many as he could, and probably more rocks underneath it. And he fertilized it, and he planted it, and grew some flowers until it was looked beautiful. And one day his minister came by, and he said to him, Tom, he said, what a nice job you've done. Really growing. You and God have really transplanted this whole place. It looks beautiful. And Tom said to him, Well, Minister, you should have seen it when only God had. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a, he had a funny disposition. He told lots of jokes, lots of stories. I have some of those in the book. But he also wrote letters, and he was a prolific writer. One of the things that I was fortunate that they kept in the archives is that they kept lots of letters. Most of the letters that are there were written by his family to him and his wife while they were stationed in various places during the war. His, his daughter was Peggy Sarsfield, married to George Sarsfield. 
And that's kind of the one area that I know a little bit about. I personally didn't know Peggy Sarsfield, but my sister and lots of her friends were educated by Peggy. She eventually became the head of the PE department at the Montana School of Mines, and they eventually had a, used to have a basketball tournament up there dedicated to Peggy. Bob, you can tell us more about that. Yeah, I sure could. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> this is Bob Miller, one of my neighbors. So anyway, she he, she was eventually the, by what my sister always said about Peggy that she's the only woman who gave us. She went to Girls Central, so they had nuns as as our teachers. She said she's the only one that gave us any information about sex. <laughs> that probably wasn't very much, but a little bit. <laughs> so Peggy, when I was in high school, George Sarsfield was the president of Rotary out of the uh, country club. He won uh, at least four or five state amateurs and state opens. He was an incredibly good golfer. And some of the letters that Peggy and George wrote back to them talk about their golf expertise down in Texas because they were stationed down there for quite a while. Anyway, uh, I was on the golf team in 1959, 1960, and the only place we could play was the municipal golf course, and the municipal golf course had sand greens. <clears throat> the only sand green that, that I know exists to this day is in Fort Smith, Montana, if anybody knows where that is. So anyway, I went up to George, I said, oh, how am I gonna do this? Because we played our state tournament, only one tournament a year, down in Missoula, it was a beautiful country club and they had grass greens, obviously. There was no such thing as sand greens around it, except here in Butte. So, George still occupied, he was interning as well, and he had gone into business with Tom way back when, after he got out of the army. And so I went up to George, I was shaking and everything else, I was panicking. So I asked George if we could play practice on the Butte Country Club. And he was gracious and nice and said, yeah, no problem. So we did. And that was, was the only the only really tie-in that I ever had with George Sarsen. But what a great guy he was. And the whole family was good. His son, Thomas Jefferson Davis Jr., was <coughs> in the Army and a, he was an Air Corps person down in Luke Air Force Base just called Loop Base, I think, at that time, down in Phoenix. And that's still a, a pretty famous air base down there. Anyway, he won a lot of awards. He wanted to go overseas to fight, uh, and they kept him away and kept him in Loop to train other pilots. So he never did go over there. That's the one thing that I found in Thomas Davis, I found one of the grandsons of Thomas Jefferson Davis Jr. a few years ago in Dallas, Texas. And he and I have corresponded occasionally. And something happened that that side of the family broke off from Tom and Heather. And they either never saw him again or they didn't communicate again with each other. And the brothers and sisters didn't communicate. So when I asked Shirley Williams Davis about that, she said, Joe, I'll talk about anything, but I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. So whatever went on, we don't know. I do have some letters from both Tom Davis Jr. and his wife back to the family. They were very cordial and very nice, but you can, beyond it, they were, I think, I, this is my suspicion, is that Thomas Jefferson Davis Jr.'s wife was a little bit outtaken by the Davis family. She, she wanted them to be a little more upscale, uptick. She wasn't too happy with the whole information. So I don't know that to be a fact. I'm just giving you my opinion. Okay. And that's strictly based on the letters that 
that she wrote. Tom had a great sense of humor, and uh, one of the things that uh, that I came across was a little letter that he wrote to his children from Santa Claus. So I thought I'd read this letter. It's not very long. Santa has been here and is resting before leaving for the rest of his trip. The snow has made it beautiful and has not interfered with his traveling. I left many and beautiful gifts for you all. I do this because you have been good children. That is to say, not always perfect, but quite good. I'm very proud of Shirley's schoolwork. Those hundreds are fine, Shirley. I notice you sometimes talk back to mother and complain about your hair being crushed. Do not do that, as your curls are lovely. But generally, you are a very sweet girl, and Santa loves you. I love that whole thing because my mother and sister just got into huge fights about her hair. <laughs> Peggy and Junior are good children too, but quarrel too much and are cross too often. This worries your mother and daddy, but again, are generally they are very good and Santa is proud of them too. If Grandpa Davis comes down for the Christmas, surely give him my love and ask him if he remembers the thing I bought for him when he was a boy. Be good to mother, all of you, and try to be better boys and girls. Do better in school if possible, and everyone will love you even more than they do. But I must be on my way, way, so with love, I kiss you. Good night. Santa Claus. Aww. I have one letter that I thought was kind of really talked about Tom in a, in a little different way and one that, that I think tells more about the person and the personality. He uh, traveled a great deal, not only for Rotary, but also for the whole thing of, of himself and what he did with his corporation. And this one came from the Bar Corporation in Bluffton, Indiana. My dear Tom, here is hoping that you reach home, not too tired by the long trip. It was a treat to have you with us, and I have heard many expressions of pleasure for your fine address and your friendly mixing with the men after the closing of the more formal part of the meeting. The men in this part of Indiana will keep you in their memory. You're picking out Jerry Kibar of Muncie, the elderly man with the canes, and talking to him as he was getting back to his auto was a very general, gracious set act, and I know he will get a thrill as he told you he had met you in Chicago years ago. Jerry was an official of the Indiana Union Traction Company and very active. The years have caught up with him, and he cannot get around so well like the rest of us. The, he appreciates the recognition and contacts with old friends. I'm enclosing a clipping from the Bluffton newspaper concerning your address. Tell Miss Brew how much we appreciated her two letters from her with regards to you and Mrs. Davis. And to you, I am sincerely yours, Bill Barr. It kind of tells you a little bit about the kind of person he was and why he was so well liked by everybody that he met. There's a, another story that, and I happen to pull this out solely because I happen to live there for a long time. And Thomas Davis was at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, getting operated on. And this was a roughly 1952. And he writes this letter back to his family. He said, Posts call this the land of the sky blue waters. Really, it is the land of the poker faces and non-committal answers. Not very funny, but very fine men and women. I only know I am to be operated on by Dr. Wow. I've since looked, about, looked him up, and he was an internal medicine guy and uh, did lots of operations on colons and things like that. So that's what it was about. He never says in this letter 
that it's an operation on its colon, but that's what it was. I have not seen him yet. He has been away. He told, he held consultations Monday and is operating today. I am to see him Wednesday morning for consultation. Several other doctors have been in to see me and most have been kind. I have been, I've seen a number of people who have had similar operations in mind and all soon to be, to come out quite well. I ran into young Fitzgerald, an attorney from Livingston, who was a friend of George's. His father, who is 982, had a similar operation and in addition was a diabetic and at the end of the three weeks he's up and going home. He looked rather well, although tired. It is my opinion, based on only on information, that he is not old so much as the counts in the matter, but the condition of the patient and the other, and what they find, I can get in there. I am in good condition and I'm, I'm not afraid. So he went through the operation. He ended up dying in 1952, and as far as I can tell, he died of a heart condition. I had mentioned that Tom was a, a great athlete, and he got lots and lots of awards here in Butte, Montana, and they wrote lots of, uh, there's a, lot, a number of news articles about him and his baseball prowess. That was the beginning, if I recall, of the Copper League in Butte, so that was kind of the, just the, the start of all the baseball that went on. So I'm going to stop right now and see if there's any questions. When did he join Rotary? Join Rotary in 1916. So just shortly after he came back from uh, Michigan. Or what, I actually, I guess it's probably the same year. Rotary, I, I Can you tell us about the banner? Sure. I, wrote, I just made it up and put a lot of different things on it. Um, I did this in 2015, so I just took a lot of different things from him and his family and Rotary in general. So this was the this top part is the first, the charter members of the Rotary Club, which was organized in 1914 but not really formalized until 1915, okay? And that's why we had the 100th anniversary of that that year. So I wrote a, there I have different pictures of him, including Peggy Sarsfield, one of his daughters, George Sarsfield, who was also very active in Rotary, as well as a golfer. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention about George is that he not only uh, won all the state amateurs and state opens, but he also qualified to play in the both the US amateur and the British amateur which he played in. He didn't win either one of them, but he did play in them. Uh, and this is a picture of his, where he lived in Idaho Street. I've gone by that house. I, I should have gone in, in and seen him. <clears throat> Try to meet the people. The, the house is still being occupied, but you, there are so many bushes in front of you, you cannot see the house. It's at 521 South Idaho Street. That's where he grew up. He eventually lived out in 2700 Florida. Okay. He did run for Senate uh, in 19, you know, I forget what year that was, 48, I think. Uh, he ran against Murray, who was <coughs> kind of been in there forever and ever. So it was a tough road to win that, uh, that election, but he did run against it. Uh, this is a picture of George Sarsfield and Peggy Sarsfield at Glacier National Park where there's a, I have some pictures up here. Uh, National Geographic did a special on Glacier National Park in 1956. And I have two copies of that National Geographic. <coughs> Take a look at them. It's mostly about the park but it has a section in it about the Peace Park and the fact that it was established primarily by Thomas Jefferson Davis and 
some of the district governors from Canada. So there's a little outside of the East Glacier building, there's a plaque dedicated to Thomas Jefferson Davis. So if anybody is up at the East Glacier, you can see that. What's significant about that? Well, it was the first peace park formed in the world at that time. There was never, there was never any other peace park, so it was number one. Since that time, there have been a number of other peace parks formed, but that one was the first one ever formed, so that's significant. And not only what Davis did, but how he got other people to look at the whole thing, including the people from Canada, because it took both sides. Any other questions? Just a comment, uh, further information on George Sarsfield. <coughs> I'm told that he uh, was very active in Rotary as well, and in fact was worked his way up to the highest levels of responsibility in Rotary and was in line to become the uh, international president of Rotary at one point. He didn't quite get that because they changed the hierarchy and the protocol and started including presidents from countries other than the U.S. But he was very uh, active in Rotary. Right. A year before he became president of Rotary International, George is, I'm talking about George now, uh, Rotary International changed its format so that every year they switched. They'd have a U.S. president one year and the next year it was somebody from some other country other than the U.S. Primarily, it could be Asia or Europe or wherever it was. But so George missed his chance and didn't get another one. So otherwise, we would have had two presidents from Butte, Montana. Um, kind How of an interesting. How many children did he have? Uh, Thomas Jefferson had three children. Peggy, the oldest, Peggy Sar who became Peggy Sarsfield, married George Sarsfield. Thomas Davis, Jr., who ended up in Texas. And Shirley Williams, whose husband, believe it or not, was, uh, I, don't, I forget his first name. But they, uh, he had the Kaiser Frazier dealership. It used to be over on, uh, near the, uh, where the uh, community hospital is now. I'm trying to think of the street name. Uh, it's right on Silver Street, I think. But he had the Kaiser yeah. Frazier yeah. dealership. And uh, he ended up, uh, Shirley told me he ended up being the, in the national sales manager for Kaiser Frazier. And, lived, and they moved him to Scottsdale, Arizona. And eventually, of course, Kaiser Frazier disappeared off the face of the earth. I mean, it lost it. But I, I remember cars of that. How about? What was Mr. Davis's connection to the First National Bank? Uh, I'm not aware of it. I didn't know he had no connection. No connection. To Davis. No, it's a totally different Davis. My dad worked for the First National Bank, so I can tell you that that Davis and Tom so Davis were different, not related. Different Davis family. Different, different, different Davis family. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. One one of the things that Tom was was a staunch Baptist, and that's kind of putting it mildly. Uh, he was very well known by the Baptist community, and I maintain that. Uh, He'd have a statue up in Butte, Montana, if he had been a Catholic instead of a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> but I think he was a Baptist at the church up there at Mountain View up in Centerville. Uh, I think that's when he was a member of at that time, because I don't think the Baptist church down in Floral existed at that time. I'm not aware of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, when you go back uh, 80 plus years ago, in the 40s, when he was president of uh, the International Rotary, um, and you go back to the turn of the century when he was growing up, if you go back there and you think about transportation and communication, when you hear about people traveling internationally, or going across the state of Montana and Idaho and so forth. Uh, it was just a different world. It's so hard to comprehend 
what communication and transportation challenges must have been uh, present to those people trying to organize things, trying to keep in touch, trying to make things happen. Can you just comment a little bit about what it must have been like? You know, I can't even, well, obviously, at that point in time, in the 40s, uh, train travel was the number one. Uh, planes were used, obviously, but they weren't as big as they were. So. When he traveled someplace, he'd be gone for a considerable period of time because it wasn't like he was flying back and forth, back and forth. So if he went to South America, he was there for a couple of months. So he most of the while he might fly from here to Rio or wherever it was that he was going, he'd be he from his travels once he got there would mostly be by, by car or by bus or some other transportation means. He was always happy, I can tell you, to get home. I do have a, I can't, I, been, I was looking for it and I, I can't find it uh, off the top of my head, but I do have a letter that he wrote uh, to the Rotarian here in Butte about how happy he was to arrive back in Butte, Montana, where he, it, it was his home. So that was a, it's a great story and how he loved getting back here. There are a few other things that he said and quoted on a kind of regular basis. He, uh, he quoted a guy by the name of Sam Jones, and I don't know who Sam Jones was, but he said, Sam Jones apparently said, if each man will reform himself, he will be sure that one rascal has been eliminated from society. <laughs> he he kind of talked a lot about things like that. He talked about what can Rotary do, how different, how different, what, what can Rotary do. He was a, definitely a Rotarian, but what, what Rotary can do when the war ends, when peace comes. And he was, you know, a big proponent that peace would come eventually, but the question was, how's it going to look? He wanted, he was part of the very beginning, Truman appointed a group of people to the beginning of the UN Charter, and he appointed people just to look into the whole idea of the UN. We didn't, he didn't call it the UN, I forget his words for it, but he was trying to promote that, and he appointed Thomas Jefferson Davis as one of the first members of that group to look into what they could do to try to help countries talk to each other instead of fighting with each other. So we established the UN, but we still fight each other, right? Or it seems like that. The, uh, I think the big thing, two things that I personally uh, love about Davis was his devotion to kids, to getting kids moving, to getting kids doing things. Uh, his daughter, Shirley, was a member of the Butte High ski team. So he, he, while there's nothing in there, any of his stuff about women in sports or anything about that, he obviously promoted Shirley. And Shirley talked about that a little bit to me, about his proposal to try to get women into the YMCA and so on. Okay? Eventually they did become members, but they weren't when I was growing up. So the women kind of had, surely, I mean, uh, his daughter, Peggy, was obviously a good athlete, and she was a big proponent of women's athletics, and particularly true of the Mon at Montana Tech. When did so women that, come into Rotary, excuse me? Pardon me? When did women start being accepted into Rotary team? <coughs> 1979, is that right? I think it was later than that. It was the 80s. Late yeah, 80s. 80s. Was it? I don't know. <coughs> they, uh, there was a women's group that Hester ran, uh, and Peggy was involved in it, uh, that was a kind of an offshoot of the women, of the members of Rotary, of the men's club. And uh, they had, they sold milk and a few other things and made quilts and 
did other things to raise money primarily for the orphans in beautiful Tim. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that, that she was involved with a little bit. <coughs> this year, <coughs> we here in the District 5390, as well as some districts in Canada and one of the districts in Idaho, have a meeting every year for the Peace Park Assembly. And it's usually held in mid to late September. And uh, they're going to have a little special this year uh, for they're trying to get lots of people involved in it. And our club, along with the Helena Club and a few others, are trying to promote uh, a big bash, so to speak, at East Glacier. And East Glacier cannot accommodate all of us, but we usually try to do a pretty good job there of trying to get speakers and various other things to get help in it. Bob Miller is one of the guys in charge of that, along with a few others. So the, uh, it's kind of, what Tom Davis started has continued in, in much the same way. And the YMCA, obviously, has been a big, big thing. Uh, it's not as big with the student. I mean, we don't have a <coughs> guarantee of every kid getting a scholarship to the Y. Uh, that's something that would be fun to do. But I know that uh, there's some people out there looking to try to help and give kids more access to the Y and to other clubs around the city that uh, promote that. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, his name Thomas Jefferson Davis, was this a tribute to Thomas Jefferson? It's a really good uh, question. Or Jefferson, <laughs> or Jefferson Davis? You know, I, I looked into that trying to find out because the name, obviously, on the other side of the coin is hated by lots of people since he was the president of the Confederacy. And I could never find out anything that his father, why he named him Thomas Jefferson Davis. So I don't know. It's one of those kind of mysteries that I, nobody wrote about it. He was not embarrassed by having the name Thomas oh, was Jefferson. And uh, so it's uh, kind of an interesting phenomenon that uh, he was named after the Confederate president. Or, or was he named after Thomas Jefferson? Or was he named after Thomas Jefferson? Exactly. I think it was Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to clarify. I mean, I'd like to think that because there's nothing in the all both pages. Yeah. There's nothing in the literature that uh, we can deny that. Somebody else have a question? Can you speak to what the Rotary? Uh, how many members there are now? Who is the leadership? Um, what are some of your uh, service projects? Sure. Um, <clears throat> Bob Henry, who's in the back here, is one of, we have co-presidents this year. We have 33 members, is that right, or 34? I can never keep it. A little bit less. A little bit less, 32 members. At one time, back in time in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, the Rotary Club was all, over 200 members. Met at the Finland Hotel, and uh, it was a huge club, mostly devoted to uh, lots of people who were from Montana Power and from the Anaconda Company that were members of that. They had to be a little unique because each member at that time had to have a unique job. So you, you couldn't have two. If you had two attorneys, one had to be this kind of attorney one had to be something else. It was kind of a weird deal. I know that when I joined in 1992, I had to be investment manager, not just investment. So I had to have a special title than other people. But what do we do? Uh, we're, we're involved in a number of projects in Butte. Uh, I should bring out my guys to talk about it. But uh, we. Uh, we do a lot of things for kids in Butte. We also do the Modest Canyon Trail. That's one of our big projects. We uh, recently started doing the landscaping up at Montana World Mining Museum. 
But actually, I ask Leo to. He he gave us a great report on current activities. He's a, he's also a president. Yeah, so he, Leo, he let him speak in there. He gave. A, he's the uh, also the co-president. Leo. <laughs> well, I'll add one thing, Picker, that I'm really happy that we do with Rotary, and that is we support Action Inc. in their homeless youth housing program here in Dean. And when you think about homeless people, you have certain ideas of what that might entail, but youth, you know, people 18 to, to 24 years old, there are a lot of people, and here in our town, who have no home. And Action Inc. is, is um, one of the agencies that helps to provide a place for them, and we support them with uh, funding for their uh, uh, personal living effects and things that they need in those apartments. So that, I think that's a great thing. You mentioned Maud, uh, Maud S. Trails. We do a lot of work on that. Um, a lot of other things that have to do with Mining City Christmas, or uh, uh, we, we support View Parks and Recs, the Parks and Trails Foundation, and Joe, you're the one that organizes the Duck Derby every every summer to help provide funds for that. Right. Yeah, you guys uh, come out to see the ducks race down the, the uh, trail at, uh, at the, at the uh, I've been wanting to do it down Silver Bowl Creek, but the ducks get caught up in the willows, the two big willows. <laughs> So I can't keep them. Last year we did, uh, we sold 525 ducks. Uh, there are some, literally, there's a, the biggest one, the biggest duck derby is held in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Uh, part of the, they, 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 that in Portland, uh, the Rotary clubs there, there's about six clubs get together. And they, they sell 100,000 ducks. Wow. They, ra they, they raise them down the Willamette River you should see it. They dump them out of a dump truck. <laughs> so, it's quite a quite a scene. But we've been raising roughly last year we did about somewhere we raised somewhere between twelve and fourteen thousand dollars, and half the money goes to the projects that we do, which includes the ones that Leo mentioned, and half the money goes back to the park for kids to get scholarships to swimming and that kind of thing so we give half that back to them so it's kind of a fun thing uh, a couple of years ago I dressed up as a Donald Duck and <laughs> tried to race down uh, I couldn't keep up with the parade believe it or not the parade looks like it's going slow and slow and slow but it didn't go slow that day <laughs> I'm sweating my tail off trying to chicken get to catch it like, so all next year I'll be a, Do a Donald Duck again so that's kind of fun started that. Uh, we do, each of us individually have done other things. I personally have been involved a little bit. There's a couple of halfway houses here in Butte and uh, I've been doing some help, trying to help some people, particularly those that have been on, in long-term commitment situations to help them to learn how to spend their money, so to speak. And it's kind of amazing. I have two different areas of interest in that they, I had six young men, I shouldn't call them young, they're age 20 to 60, but they, they all had one of the issues is money, okay? They don't know, either don't know how to spend it or they spend it unwisely. So it's kind of an interesting <coughs> phenomenon that goes on. A couple of them uh, made huge amounts of money, huge amounts, I mean talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, and of course went through it all because they were selling drugs illegally. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. You have kids, people who have no money because they, they spent all their money on drugs and others who had all this money because they sold drugs illegally. So you have both of those things. So we're, that, that's individually, but each one of us in, in the club, uh, each one, we all have kind of our own little pet projects. Like when you say that? Yeah. yeah I agree. Bob, has, Bob does a lot of work with, tell us about your deal, Bob. Well, I don't think it's worth, no, oh, yeah. newsworthy for this discussion. Sure but, it is. But we really, 
we do have, the Rotary Club has been uh, uh, made responsible and owns a block of land on the East Ridge Foundation, East Ridge uh, that was put, donated to the Rotary Club by uh, a then Rotarian in 1984, Keith Johnson, who donated the original property. And then subsequently we've had other donations and we now own 202 acres of land and we operate this series of trails which is very popular in the community and that's the big thing I've been involved with for the last 20 years. So I'll end this with the prayer that Thomas Jefferson used to end most of his speeches with. Each day I pray, God give me strength anew to do the tasks I do not wish to do. Yielding obedience, not asking why, to learn and know the truth and scorn the lie. To look a cold world in the face, to cheer for those who pass me in the race. To bear my burdens, daily unafraid, to lend a helping hand to share those who need my aid. To measure what I am by what I give, God, God give me strength that I may richly live. Amen. Amen.